Hello everyone. Thanks for coming to this session uh, on educational exclusion. So my name is Simon Wallace. I uh, am an autism consultant. I was based in the UK, trained in the UK, uh, and then moved to Germany about six years ago. We won't mention Brexit. Um, and uh, But I still do work in the UK, and this is mainly work that I did with the University of Birmingham um, School of Education. Jā, labdien visiem, un <coughs> paldies, ka esat atraduši laiku atnākušies šo uh, sesiju. Lektor vārds uh, Saimona Vēlis, uh, autisma konsultants, uh, pamatā uh, izglītojies un strādājis savienotajā karalstē, pirms sešiem gadiem pārcēlies uz Vāciju, bet turpina darbu arī apvienotajā karalistē galveno kārtu saistībā uh, sadarbībā ar Birmingham universitāti. So, just a quick overview, we're going to look at what we mean by educational exclusion, then touch on the experiences of pupils, parents and teachers, then focus on what we can do to help, and there's some websites with resources, but I'd like to try and do sort of 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then us to have a discussion, because I'm particularly interested in practice and issues in Latvia. Uh, Liliju pārskatu par manu prezentāciju, sākšu ar to, ka pastāstīšu, ko mēs saprotām ar uh, atstumšanu izglītībā, ka pa, tad nedaudz par to, kādas ir skolā un vecāku skolotāju pieredzes prakses, ko mēs varam darīt, lai palīdzētu, un pastāstīšu arī, kādi resursi ir pieejami, kādas tīmekļu vietas un tam līdzīgi. Es uh, centīšos iekļauties 45-50 minūtēs ar savu prezentāciju, un tad uh, atvēlēsim laiku diskusijā, jo man ļoti interesē arī jūsu pieredze un situācija Latvijā. So, as I said, this is just a, a, a website um, that it, it's probably worth you looking at. So, this is a, a university group in the UK at the University of Birmingham and it's called the Autism Centre for Education and Research. Uh, šī mājaslapa tā ir uh, universitātes Birmingemā mājaslapa un uh, universitātē šis ir autisma izglītības un pētniecības centrs pie Birmingemas universitātes un es iesaku tiešām ap, ap, apskatīties šo mājaslapu, paskatīties, kas tur ir. It is quite a unique center in that um, in, it, most of the academic staff are old teachers, people who trained as teachers and then have moved into the academic world. And so a lot of the research that they do is kind of practically focused. Uh, šis ir tāds unikāls centrs, jo lielākā daļa darbinieka, lielākā daļa pētnieka, kas tur strādā, pēc izglītības ir skolotāji pedagogi, kas pēc tam ir uh, saistījuši savu karjeru ar akadēmisko vīdi, un tāpēc viņi veiktie pētījumi ir tādi ļoti praksē balstīti. So they do have uh, uh, courses, and I think I'm right that they are open to anyone. Uh, so you, you need to have relatively good English, but if you wanted to do... Uh, an online course or uh, even a master's course, you can do that as a Latvian remotely and you'll have my contact details if you have questions about that. Viņi šis centrs piedāvā arī kursus, un es ceru, ka es nekļūdos, ka šie kursi ir pieejami ikvienam, protams, angļu valodā, tā tad nepieciešams angļu valodas zināšanas, bet es domāju, ka jūs arī, ja jūs interesē, varat pieteikties šiem kursiem, un turpat maģista programmas ir pieejamas. And... Um, there's uh, uh, resources, so we did lots of resources over COVID to support families in COVID, and there's also the research, and the research is what I'll be talking about today, and particularly this report here at the bottom, uh, the name of which is Investigation of the Causes and Implications of Exclusion for Autistic Children. Uh, tā, šeit ir apkopoti arī resursi, ļoti daudz resursus mēs izstrādājam Covid laikā, lai palī, īpaši, lai palīdzētu vecākiem, un ir arī sadaļa par pētījumu, par ko šodien runāšu, un īpaši runāšu par uh, jaunāko pētījumu ziņojumu, ar nosaukumu uh, pētījums par um, uh, atstumšanas cēloņiem un sekām bērniem un jauniešiem ar autismu. So as I said yesterday, if, for those of you who heard me talk yesterday, 
Our education system is broken up to individual countries in the United Kingdom. So what I'll be talking about is just England today, not the whole of the United Kingdom. Un uh, atgādināšu tiem, kas vakar nepiedalījās, kā apvienotajā karalistē izglītības sistēma ir atšķirīga katrā, katrā zemē, un tas, par ko es sāstīšu šodien, tas attiecas tikai uz Angliju. So, again, for those of you who didn't hear my talk yesterday, we know because our government, the English Department for Education, published data on autism in schools every year. Uh, un uh, šī informācija ir nākusi no tā, ka uh, Anglijā attiecīgā val, valsts iestāde, valdības iestāde publicē, publicē statistikas datus par autismu skolā katru gadu. So 2.2% of children in English schools have a diagnosis of autism. Anglijas skolās autisma diagnoze ir 2,2% bērnu. And uh, that's going up at about 10% per year. Šis rādītājs paaugstinās par aptuveni 10% gadā. And uh, the vast majority of our pupils, our autistic pupils, are in what we call mainstream schools. So a, a regular school, I'm not sure what the, I'm sure you know. Un lielākā daļa bērnu ar autismu mācās tās augtās vispārējās izglītības skolās. So our government also do publish every year on exclusion. So we have those data for autism, um, but when they publish their data, they publish it on two types of exclusion. One is permanent exclusion and the other is temporary, and you can read out those definitions. <laughs> Un tāpat arī attiecīgā valsts iestāde katru gadu publicē datus par atstumšanu jeb izslēgšanu no skolas un viņi izšķir divu veidu atstumšanu no skolas. Pirmais tā pastāvīga atstumšana, jeb ka bērns tiek izslēgts no skolas, viņam lūdz neatgriezties skolā un atrast alternatīvu citu skolu vai izmanto citu pakalpojumu. Un pagaidu jeb izslēgtīga atstumšana, ka uh, bērns tiek, nu, tā kā atstādināts no mācībām parasti uz vairākām dienām, bet tad atgriežas tajā pat skolā. So we have permanent exclusion, temporary exclusion, that's official exclusion. And then we have unofficial exclusion or what we call illegal exclusion. And that's when a child may be uh, excluded because really the school can't handle their disability. So it may mean that they phone the parent and say, Johnny is behaving very badly today, you need to come and pick him up and he loses half a day of school, that kind of thing. Par šiem pirmajiem diviem atstumšanas veidiem pastāvīgā un pagaidu ir oficiālie statistikas dati pieejami, taču pastāv arī trešais veids neoficiālā vai nelikumīgā atstumšana, kad bērnu palūdz atstāt skolu vai nenākt uz skolu, pamatā tāpēc, ka skola netiek galā ar bērna problēmām un uh, tiek, piemēram, piezunīts vecākiem, kā jūs dēls skolā uzvedas ļoti slikti, lūdzu brauciet viņam pakaļ. Ok, so if we look at the government statistics for the Department for Education in England, the rate of permanent exclusion, which is when a child is told to go away from school and don't come back, they need to find their own new school, is roughly the same as what you see in the general school population. Uh, un, ja raugamies oficiālajiem statistikas datiem, tad uh, pastāvīgās atstumšanas jeb izslēgšanas gadījumi, tad uh, to uh, proporcionālais skaits ir aptuveni tāds pats kā vispār, vispārējās izglītības skolās kopumā. Uh, fixed term exclusions, which is the temporary exclusions, again an official type of exclusion, uh, it's twice as likely to happen to autistic pupils than non-autistic pupils. Izlaicīgā izslēgšana jeb atstādināšana no skolas uh, divreiz biežāk notiek ar uh, attiecībā pret bērniem ar autismu nekā pret pārējiem skolēniem. Uh, unofficial or illegal exclusions, obviously we don't have data on that, but a report by uh, this organisation at the bottom ambitious about autism said that it could be as high as over half 
of autistic children who have experienced some type of official or illegal exclusion. Un runājot par šo neoficiālo atstumšanu, protams, šeit mums nav statistikas dati, tad šeit mēs balstāmies uz pētījumu, ko esmu šeit pieminējis, šis ir organizācijas veikts pētījums, un saskaņā ar to vairāk kā puse bērnu ar autismu var piedzīvot šādu neoficiālo atstumšanu no skolas. Um, and the government also published data, so the schools, when they exclude a kid, so this is again fixed term or permanent exclusions, when they exclude, they have to fill out documentation that gives the reason why they excluded the child. Un uh, runājot par šiem divi, diviem pirmajiem uh, oficiālajiem uh, izslēgšanas veidiem, tad, ja skolas to dara, tad uh, skolā ir arī jāizpilda um, ziņojums veidlapa, norādot precīzi iemeslu. And as you can imagine, the vast majority of reasons why the child is excluded is to do with behaviour. So we have a category called persistent disruptive behaviour, that's very common as a reason. Things like aggression towards other children or the teacher, that's another reason. Or verbal aggression towards a teacher or to another pupil, that's another big reason. Un lielākā daļa no norādītajiem iemesliem, protams, ir saistīta ar uzvedību. Ļoti populārs iemesls ir pastāvīga traucējoša uzvedība, agresija pret pedagogiem vai citiem bērniem, arī verbāla agresija, tāda tie, tie visbiežāk norādītie iemesli. Um, so, as I said, really the only options for schools to give a child focused options about the kid, there's very little, well there's nothing, that allows them to give an explanation that this is something to do with our knowledge or the environment that we create, but those are the factors, the non-child factors that we were most interested in in the research. <laughs> Un, kā jau minēju, tad šī iemesli nav, neviens no šiem iemesliem netiek saistīts ar tādiem faktoriem, kas nav atkarīgi no bērnu, kas ir atkarīgi, piemēram, no vides, no citiem faktoriem, kas, protams, mūs visvairāk interesētu. So, um, the last point is that we were in a session earlier about legislation and policy. In the UK, there's quite strict legislation about what schools can and can't do when it comes to disability. So this project is also enshrined in the fact that um, under certain type, I won't go into what it is, but under certain legislation in the UK, there are things that they should and shouldn't be doing. So that's a big part of what we're talking to teachers about and training them about. Un uh, iepriekš es biju sesijā par politikas jautājumiem, un uh, man jāsaka, ka um, Anglijā skolas ir stingri regulētas ar stingriem tiesību aktiem, kur ir arī skaidri noteikts, ko drīkst un ko nedrīkst darīt saistībā ar invaliditāti, un tas ir tas arī, ko mēs vienmēr uzsveram apmācībās skolotājiem. And the key phrase that you heard, if you were here yesterday, from multiple colleagues is reasonable adjustments. That's the key phrase within law that we're always referring to, particularly with teachers, that under the Equality Act, they have to adjust their practice and the environments so it's suitable and optimal for a child with a disability. Un uh, jau vakar bieži dzirdēt arī šodien droši vien viena no bieži dzirdētajām uh, atslēgas frāzēm ir saprātīga pielāgošanās, kas tiek izmantota arī likumā un saskaņā ar vienlīdzības likumu uh, ir pienākums uh, saprātīgi pielāgot vidi, saprātīgi pielāgot uh, praksis skolotājiem, lai tā būtu piemērot arī bērniem ar invaliditāti. So, uh Key research questions <coughs> were, number one, what are the underlying causes of education exclusion? What's the impact on pupils and families? And what can we do to reduce the frequency of exclusion occurring? Šie bija galvenie pētījuma jautājumi proti, kas izraisa, kāda ir iemesli atstumšanai no izglītības, kāda ir šīs atstumšanas no izglītības ietekme uz skolēniem ar autismu un viņu ģimenēm, un ko varētu darīt, lai mazinātu šādu gadījumu skaitu. 
And our methodology was something called mixed methods. So we did surveys with autistic adults, parents and teachers, and we did interviews, um, I think maybe just with parents and teachers. But it was a mixture of interviews, questionnaires with those three groups. Runājot par metodoloģiju, mēs izmantojām jauktu metodoloģiju bija gan aptaujas anketēšana, kur piedalījās pieaugušajā rautīsim vecāku un skolotāji, un bija arī intervijas, ja pareizi atceros, tad intervijas bija ar vecākiem un skolotājiem. So we had a relatively small number, it was only 22 autistic adults, but around the time of exclusion, 81% of them said they were being bullied. So this is them looking back at their time in school, when they were excluded, around that time, 81% of them were being bullied in that period. Un lai arī to pieaugušo ar autismu skaits, kas aizpildīja aptaujas anketi, bija samērā neliels, tikai 22 cilvēki, 81% no viņiem atzina, ka skolas laikā, tad, kad viņus atstūma no skolas, viņi ir pieredzējuši skolā šo bulingu jeb apcelšanu. 64% of them were not diagnosed at the time of the exclusion event. So, why that matters, I won't ask you the question, but why it matters is that we know for a fact there are a lot of undiagnosed autistic children still in schools in England, uh, but without a diagnosis they don't get uh, rights for support and they don't get protection under legislation. 64% no respondentiem atbildēja, ka viņiem nebija diagnosticēts autismus tajā brīdī, kad notika izslēgšana atstumšana no skolas, un kāpēc tas ir svarīgi, Arī šobrīd Anglijā skolās ir daudz bērnu, kam nav diagnosticēts autismus, un līdz ar to viņi nesaņēm likumā paredzētu atbalstu un aizsardzību. What we have in the UK is a primary school, which is up to the age of 11, and then 11 and above is called a secondary school. And that period from going to primary to secondary has always been one that we know autistic is pupils really struggle with. I think here maybe it's from grade 3 to grade 4. Anglijas skola sistēma ir tāda, ka ir sākuma skola līdz 11 gadu vecumam, un tad mūsu izpratnē vidusskola pēc 11 gadu vecuma, sākot no 12 gadiem, un tieši šī pārēja parasti, tas ir tas posms, kas ir parasti visgrūtāk pārvarams bērniem ar autismu. Es domāju, ka Latvijā tas varētu atbilst trešai ceturtai klasēji. For these autistic adults, most of them were saying the exclusion happened in their secondary school, normally around 13 years of age upwards. Un no šiem pieaugušajiem, kas bija atstumti no skolas, tad viņi teica, ka šī atstumšana notika vidus skolas līmenī, nu galvenokārt ap 13-14 gadu vecumu. And our secondary schools, uh, again, I've, I don't know what it's like here in Latvia, but our secondary schools do change a lot. So you're talking about maybe one and a half to two thousand children, big environment, noisy, unpredictable, all the kind of things that actually autistic people tend not to like. Un es nezinu, kā ir pie jums, bet mums pārēji uz vidusskolu nozīmē milzīgas izmaiņas. Tas ir pusotrs līdz 2000 skolēnu skolā, trokšņaina, neparedzama vīda. Nu tieši tas viss, kas cilvēkam ar autismu ir visgrūtāk pieņemams un pārvarams. And the emotions, we asked them about the emotions they were feeling around the time of diagnosis and they were anxious, stressed, confused, worried and, and angry as well. A lot Me, of anger. Mēs uzdevām arī jautājumu par viņu emocijām, kādas viņi izjūta šajā laikā pirms atstumšanas un tad tās biežāk nosauktās bija stress, apmulsums, bāžas un arī dusmas. Ok. So moving, these are the parents' findings. So we we had uh, responses from 201 parents to our survey, uh, and we asked them, you know, what are the causes of your child being excluded? And most of the reasons uh, for exclusion they gave were around the fact that the school couldn't cope with their child. 
uh, mainly focused on the child's behaviour. Again, very child focused and very little recognition that the parents could see that they had a role to play in this exclusion event. Un uh, runājot par uh, vecāku sniegtajām atbildēm, tad 201 vecāku sniedz atbildi šajā aptaujā un uh, uz jautājumu, kāda bija iemesla, kāpēc viņu bērnu atstūma no skolas, tad uh, lielākā daļa atbilžu bija, ka skola netika galā ar bērnu, tur bija galveno kārtu uzvedības problēmas, atkal tas viss, kas ir atkarīgs, kas attiecas uz pašu bērnu, bet ne, ne tie faktori, kur, piemēram, vecāki varētu iesaistīties un ietekmēt. So here are some quotes. <coughs> uh, they couldn't cope with my son. It was easier to send him home. They couldn't deal with her extra needs, which were, weren't many. However, in other areas, they shone and couldn't be faulted. The head teacher claimed there were no resources to follow the EHCP is called a, an educational health care plan, which comes with a child who has a diagnosis. And it's their kind of the benefits and the supports that come within education and health for a child who has a disability. Un šeit es esmu arī dažus uh, citātus uz slaidu uzlicis, ka, piemēram, viņi netika galā ar manu dēlu, vieglāk bija sūtīt viņu mājās, uh, viņi nevarēja apmierināt viņas mm, papildu vajadzības, kurš, kuras gan nebija daudz, bet nu, citādās, citās jomās uh, Viss bija kārtībā, un uh, vēl viens citāts, kur um, direktors uh, norādīja, ka nav pietiekam resursu, lai izpildītu uh, šis saīsinājums, tas ir speciāls izglītības veselības aprūpas plāns, kas tiek izstrādāts bērniem ar diagnozi, lai viņiem sniegtu vajadzīgo, nodrošinātu vajadzīgo aprūpu un atbalstu. Uh, other reasons were lack of knowledge and training in teaching staff. Um, and their failure to understand this concept of reasonable adjustments, changes that they need to be making to the classroom environment to make it more comfortable for the autistic pupil. Uh, vēl starp minētajiem iemesliem ir, bija arī tas, ka skolotājiem trūkst zināšanu par autismu, trūkst zināšanas un uh, arī vēlēšanās uh, nodrošināt šos vajadzīgos pielāgojumus vidēji lasēji. But parents were very understanding that teachers have a difficult job. So there is lots and lots of pressure on schools from the government in the UK around performance. So there are league tables, each one's kind of competing against each other to see who's best. And we have uh, inspections. So this word here, Ofsted. So each school is inspected by an independent body and they're given ratings. Bet uh, vecāki bija arī ļoti saprotoši, jo Anglijā skolas izjūt ļoti lielu spiedienu nodrošināt vajadzīgo sniegu un vajadzīgos mācību sasniegumus, ko skolas arī konkurē savā starpā. Un šis te Ofsted pieminētais tā ir um, regulāra pārbauda, regulāra inspekcija, ko neatkarīgi iestāda veic skolās. So schools, if you talk to schools, what they feel is, is that their budgets are being cut their money's being cut, they're seeing more and more kids with difficulties in their schools, so 10% increase just in autism every year, and their staff are stressed, their staff are upset, so what their concern is, and the parents are recognising this, is that there's enormous pressure on schools, uh, and often they can't manage a child who's different. Uh, taču arī skolām neiet viegli, skolām tiek samazināts budžets, vienlaicīgi, kā jau minēju, uh, pat 10% katru gadu pieaug bērnu ar autismu skaits skolā, un līdz ar to uh, arī pedagogi ir uh, stresā, un uh, viņiem ir bāžas, ka viņiem, viņiem vienkārši nav resursu, nav iespēju uh, nodrošināt visu nepieciešamo šādiem bērniem. So, the next question is, what's the impact of educational exclusion on autistic pupils and their families? Uh, and we've got here at the question, parents were asked how exclusion impacted their child. Nākamais jautājums bija par to, kāda šai atsumšanai no izglītības ir bijusi ietekme uz pašu bērnu un uz ģimenēm. 
Un pirmā atbilšu grupa, tas ir, kā vecāk atbildēja uz jautājumu, kā atstumšana no izglītības ir ietekmējusi viņu bērnu. So about half reported being stigmatized, so being excluded from school comes with a stigma. You have been labeled as a naughty or misbehaving school and that stigmatizes the child as well as the parent and the family feels stigmatized about that as well. Un vairāk kā puse atzina, ka uh, atstumšana no skolas uh, nozīmē arī stigmatizēšanu, jo gan attiecībā uz bērnu, gan attiecībā uz ģimeni, tā tad bērns ir nejauks, neprot uzvesties, un attiecīgi šāda, šāda birka tiek uzkarināta arī ģimenē. Uh, half felt that it impacted school performance, so their educational outcomes were lower as a result of... Um, of being excluded. Uh, 50% atz norādī, ka ta, tas ir negatīvi ietekmējis mācības niegumu. Um, this sense of anger, you definitely from the autistic adults there was a sense that they were angry with the education system. And, you know, just over half here felt that they had been let down. Uh, vēl ir jāpiemina arī dusmas, dusmas uz izglītības sistēmu un nedaudz vairāk kā pūsts arī šajā gadījumā atzina, ka uh, viņi jūtas tā kā pamesti, izslēgti no šīs sistēmas, pievīlus viņus ar izglītības sistēmu. So this next one, 58%, was a very important figure that came through for me. So 58% said they became isolated from their friends. Uh, šis nākamais man pašam šķiet ļoti svarīgs, proti 58 vecāki norādīja, ka bērni tika izolēti no draugiem. And I'm a strong believer that most, not all, but most autistic pupils want social relationships. Un uh, man ir ļoti stingra pārliecība pašam, ka ja ne visi, tad lielākā daļa cilvēka ar autismu vēl šīs sociālās attiecības. And what I always ask people to think about is how important those relationships are in school. They're so precious for your social emotional development, for your academic development, for your well-being, all of these things. And by excluding autistic pupils, we're removing and we're damaging those peer relationships that they pres they're so precious to them. Un uh, īpaši skolas vidē šīs uh, sociālās atie, uh, attiecības ir ļoti, ļoti svarīgas un ļoti nozīmīgas. Tā ir gan, uh, gan sociālā piederība, tas um, atstāja iespaidu arī uz akadēmisko sniegumu, uz labūtību. Un atstumjot skolēnu no izglītības sistēmas, tas visu viņam tiek atņemts. Moving on to how it affected, so that the last one is very high, but very understandable, it impacts self-esteem. And if we move on to how the parents were impacted, 97% said that it caused them stress. Runājot par to, kā tas ietekmēja ģimeni, tad 97% norādīja, kā tas izraisīja stresu. So, just to be clear, this is how it impacted the parents and the family. Tad šī ir ietekma uz vecākiem un ģimeni. So you've got parents who are stressed anyway. The majority of autistic uh, parents of autistic kids are stressed and anxious and going through pretty horrific times themselves. But the exclusion event ramped that stress level up way, way too high. Uh, bērnu ar autismu vecāki jau tā bieži vien ir, ir stresā, viņiem ir trauksme, jo tas nav vieglas laiks, un 97% atzina, ka atstumšana no izglītības sistēmas vēl vairāk palielināja, pastiprināja šo stresu. Three quarters said that they had to take time off work because of the exclusion event. 76% trīs ceturtdaļas atzina, ka viņiem bija uh, jāiet prom no darba. And so this was an important figure for me, uh, which led on to some another research project that we did, where we looked at the kind of financial and employment impact of uh, parents having their kids in English schools. 
Un šis arī manā skatījumā ir ļoti svarīgi, un tas bija iemesls un pamats, kāpēc mēs veicām vēl vienu pētījumu par to, kā šī situācija ietekmē vecāku ekonomisko un finansiālo situāciju. And we found in government data that, I won't tell you what it is, but there's a measure of economic deprivation and parents of autistic children were 12% more likely to have this deprivation status than parents who didn't have autistic children. Un uh, raugot, ja analizējot oficiālos uh, valsts statistikas datus, mēs konstatējām, ka šī te mm, ekonomiski nelabvēlīgā situācija, ka uh, bērnu ar autismu vecāki par 12% vairāk ir šādā ekonomiski nelabvēlīgā situācija. So exclusion is affecting employment, parental employment and it's creating financial problems. Bērnu atstumšana no skolas rada problēmas saistībā ar nodarbinātību un rada arī finansiālas problēmas ģimenē. Ok. So these are some of the autistic adults and what the impact was for them. So um, this quote here from this woman, 43-year-old woman who was excluded. So she's thinking back a long way. And we did find with the autistic adults, you know, I think our, our range, some of them were 60 years old. You could feel in the responses that they made that this wasn't something where they left school and it was forgotten. This stuck with them up until they reported to us in this survey. And she says, I still feel excluded and my self-belief is low during, due to not being accepted for who I am. Un šīs ir atbildes, ko sniedz pieauguši ar autismu, un ir svarīgi atzīmēt, ka nu, šī ir atbilde no 43 gadus vecas sievietes, bet tur bija pieaugušie, kas, kam pat 60 gadi ir, un ko mēs jūtām, kad viņi sniedz šīs atbildes, nav tā, ka viņi kaut kad senā pagātnē ir atstumti no skolas, un viņi to ir aizmirsuši, tas ir palicis ar viņiem, un tas ietekmē viņus arī turpmāk, un un piemēram šī sieviete teica, es vēl joprojām jūtos atstumta, un mana, nu, tā kā ticība sev ir ļoti zēma dēļ tā, ka mani nepieņem tādu, kādu es esmu. And so this stigma, which is very, very central to, to the data that we found about being excluded, was quite profound for the autistic person and their families. So this 20-year-old man, so he hadn't soon left school, said the other kids were very aware of me being removed and their parents were horrible. So it wasn't just the non-autistic children, but also their parents who were classifying this kid because they've been excluded as the naughty one. You hear that still a lot in the UK from parents labeling kids as being the naughty one in class. Uh, un uh, šī stigmatizācija ir ļoti, ļoti svarīga nozīmīga, jo piemēram šis 20 gadīgais vīrietis, kas arī tika atstumts jau no sākumskolas līmenī, kad viņam bija 7 gadi, viņš teica, ka mm, pārējie bērni, protams, arī bija informēti par to, ka man izslēdz, un arī viņu vecāki bija briesmīgi, kas nozīmē, ka ne tikai bērni, kuriem nav autismus, bet arī viņu vecāki demonstrē šādu attieksmi, jo lielākā daļa bērnu ar autismu tiek izslēgti, nu kā nejauki bērni ar uzvedības problēmām. So if you take this idea of how important social relationships are for you in school, okay, you have some social impairment, you have a, an autism spectrum condition, okay, so you, you're still, you, you're not, you're not starting on the best foot, and then you're excluded from school, and you're stigmatized as being the naughty kid, and the mother says, you stay away from Johnny because he's naughty, okay? How difficult is it going to be for you to build these social relationships that are so important? Un es jau pieminēju, ka īpaši skolā šīs sociālās attiecības ir ļoti svarīgas, un ja cilvēkam ir jau tā 
problēmas veidot sociālās attīstības, tā tad jau pašā sākuma punktā viņš atrodas neizdevīgākā situācijā, tad viņš tiek izslēgts, tiek stigmatizēts, un piemēram Pētrīša māma saka, tu ne, pie viņa viņš tur neprot uzvesties, viņš ir nejauks, nu tad kā šāds cilvēks varēs turpmāk dzīvē, ja kādas attiecības veidot sociālās? So all the participants we spoke to felt unsupported by their teachers and 68% felt that the teachers could have some, done something to stop the exclusion occurring. Visi dalībnie, visi šīs aptaujas dalībnieki atzina, ka viņi izjūta, ka viņi nesaņem atbalstu no skolotājiem un 68% šķīta, ka skola būtu varējusi darīt kaut ko citādāk, lai nepieļautu izslēgšanu. And this is an important figure here to draw your attention to. So 40% of autistic adults said when they went back after exclusion it got worse and 40% said well nothing changed so you have to question the value of exclusion if things are either getting worse or actually not changing at all un šis ir arī ļoti svarīgs rādītājs jo 40% teica ka Viss kļuva vēl sliktāk, kad viņi atgriezās skolā, un vēl 40% teica, ka nu, nekas jau nemainījās, tad kāda tam ir jēga, ja situācija tikai pasliktinās vai katrā ziņā neuzlabojas. Ok. So, when we spoke to teachers, so we spoke to about 94 uh, teachers, what we were targeting were education leaders, so... In English schools, you have a school leadership team that's made up of your headmaster, a deputy headmaster. Usually the head of special educational needs sits on school leadership as well, but it's made up of normally around four members of staff. Un uh, aptaujā ar skolotājiem mēs um, galvenokārt uh, uzrunājām uh, tā sauktos līderus vai šīs vadības, uh, vadības grupas pedagogus, jo Anglijas skolās ir šī, uh, ir tāda kā vadības komanda, vadības grupa, kur parasti ir direktors, direktora vietnieks, speciālās izglītības uh, par speciālo izglītības programmu atbildīgais skolotājs, nu parasti ap četriem cilvēkiem. Um. And it's, it's these individuals who make the decision as to whether the child is excluded or not, what type of exclusion that they have, for how long, those sorts of things. Un uh, tie ir tie cilvēki, kas pieņem lēmumu par bērnu izslēgšanu, uh, par to vai izslēgt uz cik ilgu laiku izslēgt un tādām lietām. And uh, so when we ask them what could be done to help, they asked for greater support from the local authority so this is the the region of the country that oversees the education plans for that school so they wanted more support from the local authority un kad mēs šiem skolotājiem uzdevām jautājumu ko varat darīt citādāk lai mazinātu iz izslēgšanas gadījumu skaitu tad ko viņi minē bija vairāk kā ka viņi vēlētos saņemt vairāk atbalstu vairāk atbalstu no uh, vietējās uh, izglītības um, iestādes pārvaldes, kas ir atbildīgi par skolas programmu. Uh, more training, more money. Protams, vairāk apmācības, vairāk naudas. And uh, this one at the bottom, appropriate placement, I think is another way of saying they shouldn't be in my school. Un uh, šis pēdējais formulējums, nu, tā burtiski tulkojot, atbilstīga izvietošana vai novirzīšana, no manā skatījumā tas tāds politi korekts veids, kā pateikt, nu, kam nevajadzētu viņš sūtīt uz manu skolu. Uh, and when we asked similar questions to autistic people and the parents, what could be done differently to reduce school exclusions, autistic people called for earlier diagnosis, as I said, many of them hadn't been diagnosed at the time of of um of exclusion and this autistic adult said if i've been diagnosed with autism perhaps they would have had more idea of how to help me un kad mēs šo pašu jautājumu ko varat darīt citādāk uzdevām pieaugušajiem ar autismu un vecākiem tad uh, paši pieaugušie ar autismu teica ka būtu bijis labi ja diagnoze būtu uzstādīta ātrāk piemēram uh, Šeit cilvēks ir teicis, ka ja šī diagnoze, man būtu uzstādīta diagnoze autisms, tad iespējams viņiem būtu, viņi būtu labāk sapratuši, kā man palīdzēt. They asked to be listened to, 
So this person says they should have sat down and asked me what the problem was. Tāpat viņa jūta, ka būtu bijis labāk, ja viņa būtu uzklausīti, un šeit citāts, ka viņiem vajadzēja vienkārši apsēsties ar mani un pajautāt, kas ir problēma. And parents asked for better communication. Vecāk norādīja, ka būtu vajadzīga labāka komunikācija. Ok, so I'm just going to quickly take you through this quote, which for me encapsulated kind of everything. And... We'll work through it, and I'll kind of take you through it step by step. Un es gribētu panalizēt šo apgalvojumu, un kāpēc to es izvēlējies. Es domāju, ka šeit ir ietverts pilnīgi viss, un es tā analīzē pa daļām to pastāstīšu jums. So the parent says, my son has autism. He's been excluded by one school after another for the last two years. So what she's saying is, this isn't one event. This is happening again and again and again and again and again. Some of the parents we talked to were saying, yeah, he's been excluded 15 times from different schools, you know. Un tas, ko saka šis vecāks, ir, manam dēlam ir autisms, viņš ir, viņu ir izslēgusi viena skola pēc otras jau pēdējos divus gadus. Un bija pat tādi vecāki, kas teica, ka pat 15 reizes viņu bērns ir izslēgts no skolas, tā kā šī situācija atkārtojas un atkārtojas. And then she says, he was a high flyer in primary, according to the head teacher, he was top university material. So this is a child who should be academically good enough to succeed in school, go on to complete all his qualifications. There's nothing to do with him academically that should stop him moving on to, to university. Un nākamais teikums, ka viņam, viņam bija ļoti labi sekmes sākums skolā, un toreiz direktori pat teica, ka viņš, viņš noteikti ir no tiem, kam jā, jāstudēja universitātei, tā tad ar akadēmisko sniegumu, ar akadēmiskajām sekmēm viss bija kārtībā. But now he has no interest, so he's disinterested and he's likely to leave without any GCSEs. So what this tells us is that for this young person, school is a terrible experience that he's going to carry with him probably his whole life. If he has children, often what we see is that's then projected onto his children and he's going to leave with very poor attainment. So he's going to have no qualifications, he's going to then not have a job, blah, 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 blah. Un tagad viņa turpina, tagad viņam nav nekādas intereses par izglītību un visticamāk viņš aizies no skolas bez attiecīgās kvalifikācijas certifikātiem, kas nozīmē, ka šim jaunietim skola ir bijusi ļoti nepatīkama pieredze un tā pieredze saglabāsies ar viņu visu dzīvi, ļoti iespējams vēlāk projecēsies arī uz viņa bērniem un tā kā viņam nav kvalifikācijas, viņam nebūs laba darba ar visām pārējām sekām. And then she says, I've been so stressed, I've had to ring the Samaritans. The Samaritans is a free service that you can phone, it's like counselling, so it's a, it's a phone call, someone sits there and helps with your mental health. So she's having to ring Samaritans because of mental health problems, and she's had to also take time off work. Tālāk šis vecāks saka, ka reizēm stresi ir bijis tik augsts, ka bija jālūdz palīdzība brīvprātīgai samariešu organizācijai saistībā ar garīgās veselības problēmām un arī ļoti bieži bija jākavē darbs. And then she talks about the process, so she's saying, I'm constantly being called into meetings. Uh, and this repeated activity from schools, their first stop is, this is something the child's done, we phone the parent, they have to come in, pick him up, or come in and he's excluded for the whole week. Often what mums were saying, particularly mums, that they were, you know, these are people who trained as lawyers, teachers, accountants, were sitting at their desk trying to work, trying to balance life, and the phone would ring, they pick it up, it's school again. Okay, then they have to go to their boss. I have to go. No, you can't go. So what they ended up having to do was to leave work. 
Un kā tālāk procesi tiek raksturots, kā ir šīs pastāvīgās sarunas, pastāvīgās tikšanās un tā kārtība ir visu laiku procedūra atkārtojas, kā ir zvans no skolas vecākiem, izņemiet bērnu no skolas un tad tiek noteikts, ka bērns nedrīkst nākt uz skolu nedēļu vai cik tur ilgu laiku. Un to lielāko tās mamas teica un liela daļa no šīm mamām ir vai nu juristi vai grāmatvēži, kas sēdēja savā darbietā un centās strādāt un atkal bija zvans no skolas, ka ir jāizņem bērns. Protams, priekšnieks neļāva doties prom, kā rezultātā bija arī jāaiziet no darba. I'll paraphrase the last part, but it's very important. So she says, exclusions do nothing to help children with disabilities, being, because in order for exclusions to work, you need to be able to manage your emotions and your impulsive behaviour. And the last sentence is, he's already out of control and in flight or fight when he acts. Un es šeit nedaudz pārfrāzēšu vecāka teikt to, proti, ka šādas izslēgšanas nedara pilnīgi neko labu bērnam, jo jātiek jau galā ir ar emocijām un ar šo impulsīvo uzvedību, un vēl viņa norāda, ka nu, tagad bērns ir vispār, viņam nav vairs nekādas, kontroles un visas viņa darbības, visa viņa rīcība vienmēr ir pārspīlēta, vai nu, vai nu. Ok. So, what can we do to help, which is probably what you really wanted to hear about. Um, I'm going to repeat myself again about reasonable adjustments. Even if it's not in law, um, you can still make reasonable adjustments, ok? Uh, un uh, tagad par to, ko varētu darīt, kas iespējams jūs interesē visvairāk, uh, atkārtoši vēlreiz šie saprātīgie pielāgojumi, uh, pat ja tas nav noteikts tiesību aktos, to vēl joprojām var izmantot. And under the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which Latvia has signed, they talk about reasonable accommodations, which is basically the same as reasonable adjustments. I think there's that. Jā, tā tad uh, ano konvencijā par cilvēku ar invaliditāti tiesībām, ko arī Latvija ir parakstījusi, arī ir šis jēdziens nu, saprātīga akomodācija, kas praktiski nozīmē to pašu saprātīgo pielāgošanos. And this is all wrapped up with the social model of disability. And the social model of disability makes the distinction between impairment and disability. So my impairment is that I find it hard to talk in class, but I'm disabled by the fact that the teacher hasn't worked with me to explore other ways of communicating. Un uh, tad vēl ir jārunā par uh, invaliditātes sociālo modeli, uh, saskaņā ar kuru tiek nošķirti šie divi jēdzieni, uh, apgrūtinājums un nespēja, ja tā burtiski tulkot, tā tad mans apgrūtinājums ir tas, ka es, piemēram, nevaru iziet klases priekšā un runāt, uzstāties, uh, bet uh, nespēju rada skolotājs, nenodrošinot kaut kādus citus iespējamās komunikāciju veidus man. So these are the types of things that once you know about the pupil, you can start thinking about in terms of reasonable adjustment. So the child says, I find the classroom environment too noisy. Okay. So a reasonable adjustment, maybe you change where they sit. Okay. To allow them to wear ear defenders, maybe. Or you may want them to have a little break from class. 
for those who were there yesterday, I was talking about small things make a big difference. And that's all that reasonable adjustments are. You're making a small difference to your environment, to your practice, and it can make a massive difference to kids, particularly if it means they're not excluded. Un lai, lai nodrošinātu šādus saprātīgos pielāgojumus, tad, protams, ir jāuzklaus pats bērns. Piemēram, ja bērnam šķiet, ka stundā klasē vide ir pārāk trokšņē, nu, tad varbūt var mainīt vietu, kur šis bērns sēž, varbūt var atļaut bērnam izmantot austiņas, kas mazinātu skaņu, varbūt var atļaut viņam paņemt kādu papildu pārtraukumu no šīs stundas. Un es jau vakar teicu, ka tās ir tādas mazas lietas, bet tieši šīs mazās lietas ir tās, kas ir vis iedarbīgākās un dod lielāko ieguvumu bērnam. So, um, anxiety in school is massive. So, when we do uh, training with teachers, I would say 25-30% of what we do is to talk about anxiety and ways of reducing stress and anxiety. So, this young person says, I get anxious not knowing what's coming next. So, you could use a visual timetable or you could use something called a now and next board. So now we're doing this, next we're doing that. It gives them some understanding of what's coming up next. You're de-stressing them because they're in control again. Things are more predictable and then hopefully they move on. Tāpat arī skolās vispār ir ļoti augsts trauksmes līmenis, ļoti augsts stresa līmenis, un kad mēs organizējam apmācības skolotājiem, tad 25-30% laika mēs stāstam par to, kā mazināt stresa līmeni skolā. Un, piemēram, ja bērns saka, ka viņš izjūt trauksmi, tāpēc, ka nezinu, kas notiks uz priekšu, kas būs nākošais, tad pavisam vienkārši risinājums, piemēram, izmantot kaut kādu vizuālu grafiku dienai, kur ir norādītas tās aktivitātes, kas notiks, vai izmantot kaut kādu tāfelītu, uz kuras ir uzrakstīts tagad daram to, un nākošais būs tas, un uzreiz bērnam kļūst vieglāk parādās šī prognozējamība. Um. So one way of us knowing about the reasonable adjustments to make is that we can complete a pupil profile. So again, I, I mentioned this yesterday. I think maybe you use it here. I, I, I think it, Liga may have said it's kind of used in schools. It's very common now to be used in, in UK schools. I think the reason that it's quite common is that teachers find it really useful. Uh, un, uh, lai uh, varētu šādus saprātīgus pielāgojumus veikt, tad uh, viens no variantiem būtu sastādīt šādus skolēnu profilus. Ja nemaldos, tad man teica, ka jūs kaut ko līdzīgu dariet šeit Latvijā. Uh, Anglijā tas ir ļoti izplatīti un arī skolotājiem tas patīk, jo skolotājiem šķiet, ka tas ir ļoti nodarīgi. So uh, it's called a, a pupil profile or it used to be called a pupil passport because it's literally one piece of paper about the child that they can take with them and if they're going from one class to another or if they're kind of going from school to an outside activity like swimming or uh, you know a play centre then it's something that they can take with them and rather than having to explain what they want they can give it to the person and it takes them four minutes, five minutes to read. Uh, un uh, reizēm to sauc arī par skolēnu pasi, jo tas ir dokuments uz vienas lapas ar pamatu informāciju, un uh, ļoti labi ir tas, ka skolēns to var paņemt sev līdzi uz nākamo skolu, uz nākamo klasi, varbūt uz kādām ārpus skolas nodarbībām, kur nav visi jāskaidro no sākuma, bet kur attiecīgais cilvēks ar 4-5 minūšu laikā ar visu informāciju iepazīties. Um, and what you do is you complete it with the child, you can speak to the parent, you can go to your colleagues, but and you have a photo, it can look nice, it can be a fun activity that you do together, but you're capturing their strengths, their interests, what their sensory sensitivities are, what makes them anxious. All of that in really important information goes on the document and based on that, you start thinking about changes that you need to make in your environment. Un lai izveidot šādu profilu, tad, protams, ir jārunā ar pašu skolēnu, var runāt ar vecākiem, var konsultēties uz kole, ar kolēģiem, protams, veikt savus novērojumus un tad attiecīgi aizpildīt informāciju. Šeit varbūt arī jauka fotogrāfija, varbūt norādītas stiprās puses, varbūt norādīts, kas skolēnā izraisa trauksmi. Un tad, pamatojoties šo informāciju, var domāt, kādi pielāgojumi varētu darboties. So, that's reasonable adjustments, that's extremely important to keep in mind. The other is behaviour. So, as I said, behaviour is the biggest reason kids get excluded, okay? So, uh, 
we've used various terms. As I was saying yesterday, naughty was very common, naughty boy, okay? Then we use things like challenging behavior. This kid is, is challenging, or who's he challenging to? Then we use the term behaviors of concern. We also have the government say persistent disruptive behavior. So we've got all of this terminology, but it's very much focused on the child. Uh, un, uh, protams, ir jāpatur prātā šī saprātīgā pielāgošanās, kā viens no galvenajiem jēdzieniem, uh, bet uh, runājot par uzvedību, tad uh, uzvedība ir visbiežāk norādītais iemesls kā izslēgšanas pamatojums, un šeit ir daudz dažādi nosaukumi, kā piemēram bērns ir nejauks, uzvedība ir uh, izaicinoša vai uh, valsts iestādes izmantošo jēdzienu pastāv but the term that we use is called distressed behavior. The child is behaving the way they are because they're upset, stressed and distressed, okay? Taču mēs to dēvējam par stresa uzvedību, jo iemesls, kāpēc bērns tā uzvedas, ir stress. And we use a, an iceberg analogy. So what teachers often see is this tip at the top. So they see shouting, biting, scratching, self-harm, all of these sorts of things. And those are the things that they use to exclude. But what they don't see underneath is the reasons for why the child is showing those behaviours. And those are usually to do with the fact that they've had sensory overload. There's too much academic stress. There's too much social stress. The day has built up. So over the time, we call it a stress bucket. So over time, you can only take a certain amount of stress and it fills during the day and then at some point it may spill over and that's when you see these distressed behaviours. Un, lai raksturot šo, mēs bieži izmantojam uh, analoģiju ar aizbergu, tas, ko redz skolotājs ir šī aizberga virsotne, uh, šī stresa uzvedība, kliekšana, košana, skrāpēšana un tam līdzīgi, bet tas, kas paliek nepamanīts, ir iemesli, kāpēc tas tā notiek, piemēram, uh, sensorā pārslodzē akadēmiskais stresu, sociālais stres, gal galā dien, dienas laikā uzkrātais stres, kā mēs to salīdzinām ar šo stresa trauciņu, kas pildās, pildās, pildās un kādā brīdī iet pār malām. So, the way that we work through with teachers is that there are three stages. And the first stage is to identify the triggers. And again, you can only do that by knowing the pupil. So again, you've got your pupil profile, your pupil passport to uh, refer to. Okay, but you need to identify for that child what is causing these behaviors. And it could be sensory, social, academic, communication, change, transition. It could be a long list. So you have to work with the pupil to find out what those triggers are. Un kā mēs to analizējam, kā mēs strādājam ar skolotājiem, ir, ka mēs identificējam šeit trīs posmus. Pirmajā posmā ir jānosaka, jākonstatē, kas ir trīgeri attiecīgajam bērnam, un šeit nedrīkst aizmirst iepriekš pieminēt to skolēna pasi vai profilu, kas būtu arī jāplūko, un ir jānosaka, kas tad izraisa šo stresa uzvedību, vai tā ir sensorā vidi, sociālā vidi, akadēmiskais spiediens, komunikācija pārslods, kaut kādas izmaiņas. Okay, then uh, what you can do, obviously prevention is much better than having to deal with the distressed behavior itself. So again, think about the reasonable adjustments you can make, build a relationship with the pupil so you can understand what their needs are, what their strengths, what their uh, differences are. Uh, you become a detective. I think good teachers are, are detectives and they're interested in learning more and more and more about this particular child, okay? And once you do that, then it makes your practice so much easier and so much better. Um, and you can consider using additional ways that the child can communicate. You have to kind of put your head in the mindset of what the child is experiencing. 
Un nākamais solis ir, ko darīt, lai novērstu šādu, jo prevencija profilaksa vienmēr ir vienkāršāka, nevis jau mēģināt risināt šīs stresa uzvedības, jau tad, ka viņa notiek. Protams, nedrīkst aizmirst par šiem saprātīgajiem pielāgojumiem, bet tāpat ir ļoti svarīgi veidot attiecības ar skolē un iepazīt viņu, uzināt viņa stiprās puses. Un es vienmēr saku, ka labs skolotājs ir tāds kā detektīvs, viņš vienmēr grib uzzināt kaut ko vairāk, un tādējādi arī skolotāja piekoptā praksi var kļūt gan labāka, gan vieglāka. So one of the things that's used quite often again in English schools is like a really clear form of like zero, one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, that kind of simply conveys the emotion or the level of emotion that that child is feeling. So rather than them having the additional pressure of, can I go out or can I do, they just have to indicate on the card, this is my level of stress, I'm going from a three to a four, OK, and then the teacher can think about some adjustments to make. Un, piemēram, viena tāda pavisam viegla vienkārša metoda, kas tiek izmantota Anglijā skolās, ir tāda kā forma, veidlapa, kur, piemēram, ir skala no 0 līdz 5, kas mēra stresa līmeni, un tā vietā, lai skolēns atkal atprasītos vai drīkst iziet ārā, viņš vienkārši atzīmē, ka viņa stresa līmenis tagad jau no 3 līdz 4 paaugstinās, un skolotājiem ir skaidrs, ka Bērnam ir jāaiziet ārā atpūsties. So you can consider timeouts. Kids are often, autistic kids are allowed to leave the classroom. Some of them may be very agitated, you know, very twitchy, because that's a way of them sensorily regulating themselves. So they may need to go outside, pace up and down a little bit. So a lot of the work that the teacher can do to make sure you're not going to a five is about bringing stress levels down, looking at the environment keeping it low intensity in terms of the sensory, keeping it low in terms of academic, keeping it low in terms of social pressure, okay? Un ļoti bieži skolās bērniem ar autismu tiek atļauts iziet no, iziet no klases, iziet no stundas uz brīdi nomierināties, tā tad skolotāja darbs ir nepieļaut, lai stresa līmenis paaugstinātos līdz tam, pieciniekam un attiecīgi regulēt vīdi, lai tā nekļūtu pārāk intensīva, ne sociālā, ne sensorā, ne akadēmiskā ziņā. Ok. So, distress behavior often will occur. Some of the things that we would say to do, stay calm, take the pupil away. So, always keep yourself. When, when emotion is transactional, ok? So, when I'm stressed, you become stressed then your stress makes me more stressed. So emotions are all about transaction. And you see that in classrooms. Pupil get stressed. The teacher's thinking, what's that autistic kid doing? He's autistic. Oh, I don't know about autism. What's, what's he going to, oh, is he going to hit me? Is he going to hit her? But uh, then the teacher feeds, uh, the kid feeds off that emotion. They get more stressed. But, so you see this uptick, this circle of stress and anxiety going higher. So your job, bring it right back down again. You keep yourself calm, your tone flat, you don't use too much language. Un, protams, ka šāda stresa uzvedība būs šāda stresa uzvedības gadījumi, un tā notiks, un galvenais jūsu uzdevums ir saglabāt mieru, jo emocijas attīstās mīja darbībā. Jā, stresēns ir viens skolēns, tad varbūt stresēns ir skolotājs, tāpēc, ka viņš redz, ka tas bērns ar autismu ir uzvilcies, viņš uztraucas, kas tagad notiks, kas būs nākošais, un Un tā pa spirāli tās emocijas, piemēram, kaut vai klasē attīstās un stresa līmenis tikai pieaug. Tā tad galvenais un pirmais uzdevums ir saglabāt mieru, saglabāt mierīgu balstoni, varbūt pat nerunāt pārāk daudz. I just give you one research example, OK, about things that you need to think about. So it says here, perhaps think about disengaging eye contact, OK? So in my PhD, my PhD was about face processing, OK? And what I found was that certain emotions, autistic people incorrectly identified as being angry. And the non-autistic kids never said that these faces were angry. 
Un vēl es gribētu pieminēt vienu pētījumu, kas bija arī man, diser, man disertācijas tēma par acu kontaktu, par acu kontaktu neizmantošanu, jo, piemēram, raksturojot emocijas, tad tur noteikti sejas izteiksme, ko bērni ar autismu uzskatītu par dusmīgu, Un asociēt to ar dusmām, tad bērni, kam nav autisms, šo pašu sejas izteiksmi ar dusmām nekādīgi neasociēja. Ok. So I worked with a lab in Finland and what we looked at, we showed pictures to autistic young people, teenagers, and the faces were like this. So either eyes closed, eyes normal or eyes wide like this. Ok. What we saw in the non-autistic kids was totally flat. That that and that made no difference and the autistic kids it went bang 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 and this was measures of their skin response and their heart rate so then we know that they're physiologically aroused by these changing eyes so the reason i'm saying it is that it's again it's come back to this small things can make a big difference sometimes what you may need to do is not engage in eye contact with the kid because if they're in an aroused state then by going, johnny what's wrong johnny what then they become more and more aroused because the eye contact is just too much for them. Un es piedalījos pētījumā laboratorijā Somijā, kur mēs rādījām attēlus ar mainīgu sejas izteiksmi, tā tad acis vai tādas pusaizvērtas vai viņas iepliešas aizvien plašāk, un tad bērni, kam nav autisms, nu, pilnībā uz šīm izmaiņām nereaģēja, viņiem tas neko nenozīmē, to tie, tomēr objektīvi mērot reakciju bērniem ar autismu, gan sirdsdarbības izmaiņas, gan ādas, reakciju, tad bērni ar autismu uz to ļoti reaģēja, un šeit atkal ir jārunā par šīm te mazajām lietām, kas novad pie lielām lietām, tad piemēram bērnam ar autismu, ja, ja iet klāt un liecas pie viņa klāt un jautā, kas notiek un, un kas un ko, viņš, viņam šī sejas izteiksmi var izraisīt pilnīgi pretēju reakciju. Um. I'm running out of time and I want to leave some time for questions. <clears throat> I talked about this earlier, I just want to highlight how important social relationships are again. And one way of avoiding exclusion is by building good social relationships and good relationships across the school. We talk about whole school approaches now, which means that every single member of staff and every pupil need to be working together to kind of fix things that are not going well within the school setting. But social relationships for autistic pupils are key for them feeling like they're in place in the school, they're supported. Okay, so one of the things that you can really focus on as practitioners is to make sure those social relationships are scaffolded and maintained across the school period. Un uh, vēl tikai gribu uzsvērt, par ko jau vakar runāju, proti par to, cik ļoti svarīgs ir sociālās attiecības un sociālās attiecības visas skolas līmenī, uh, lai bērni ar autismu justos gan, ta, tas ir ļoti nozīmīgi, lai bērni ar autismu justos gan piederīgi skolai, gan izjustu atbalstu, un ir ļoti svarīgi šīs attiecības skolas līmenī, kur jāstrādā kopā visiem skolēniem, visiem skolotājiem, ļoti svarīgi ir šīs attiecības būvēt un uzturēt. Right. Okay, so some of the things that you can think about very briefly. In the UK, we have each school has its own bullying policy. You may not use those here, but for teachers, there's no reason would stop you putting in a, bo a bullying policy for your school. Um, there's things like peer matching programs. So as a teacher, you may say, okay, well, that autistic kid there, he's got similar interests to that boy there. Okay, maybe I'd try and scaffold and facilitate a relationship there. Lunchtime clubs in terms of interest that autistic pupils typically have. So I don't need to go through them because teachers generally know what they should be doing, but all of these kinds of approaches will help you support the social environment for autistic pupils. Un vēl tikai dažas lietas, kas tiek izmantotas skolās un ko var izmantot, lai veidotu šādu atbilstīgu vidu arī bērniem ar autismu. Tātad Anglijā visās skolās ir šī apcelšanas bullying politika, 
ir arī tādas metodas tiek izmantotas, piemēram, raugoties, ka bērnam ar autismu varbūt līdzīgs intereses ar, ar kādu citu bērnu klasē, un tad viņi it kā tiek savesti kopā, lai nu, veicinātu šīs attiecības viņu starpā, tāpat ir arī dažādi pēcstundu pusdienas laika klubi proti, lai šīs intereses tieši veicinātu. So if you talk to parents, one of the things they really want is better communication from school. So as teachers, you can think about methods to improve uh, communication with parents. And again, if you improve communication, build relationships, then your chances of then excluding a kid are lower because you know much more about the family situation, what's going on with the child, whether they're sleeping, whether they have any eating problems at the moment, any physical difficulties because of their eating problems. Uh, runājot par attiecībām ar vecākiem, tad uh, vecāki jau pieminēja un ir ļoti svarīgi uzlabot uh, tieši veidot labu komunikāciju ar vecākiem, jo tad labas attiecības ar vecākiem, jo arī tas palīdzētu samazināt izslēgšanas gadījumu skaitu, jo tādējādi skolotājs zinātu daudz vairāk ģi- par ģimeni, zinātu par bērnu, zinātu, vai bērnam ir kādas citas miega vai ēšanas problēmas, traucējumi un kaut kas tāds. Okay, and then one of your biggest aims is if a child is excluded, is to try and stop that cycle. So really manage the transition back once the exclusion event has kind of finished. And make sure you do meetings with the child, meetings with the parent. You agree equally what everyone's roles, responsibilities are. You set that out in a paper. You agree it amongst each other. Okay, but your main objective is to not repeat the exclusion because these repeated exclusions are the ones that are most damaging. Un ja reiz uh, izslēgšana vai atstādināšana uz laiku ir notikus, tad uh, ļoti ir jāpievērš uzmanību un jānodrošin atgriešanās. Arī tās ir tikšanās ar uh, vecākiem, atbildību lomu, noteikšana un vienošanās, kā, kā rīkoties turpmāk, jo tieši atkārtotā izslēgšana, atkārtotā izstumšana ir visļaunākā. Okay. I mean, if you don't know about transition toolkits, there's lots of those in the UK. So these are toolkits to help not just transition with exclusion, but transition from one uh, one school to another, or even small transitions called micro transitions from one activity to another or one class to another. So that if you're interested in knowing more about that, there's lots of resources out there. Un, ja iespējams, neesat dzirdējuši par šādiem pārējas rīkiem, kas tiek izmantoti, ir ļoti daudz šādi rīki komplekti, un tas tie ir izmantojumi ne tikai, lai bērns atgrieztos skolā, bet arī citos pārējas procesos, pārējas posmos no vienas klases uz otru, no vienas skolas uz otru un tam līdzīgi, un ir ļoti daudz tādi pieejami. Uh, so I'll stop there. I'm sorry I've taken so long, but um, this is some resources, so the top one, is the Autism Education Trust. They have information on exclusions and we wrote them, uh, based on our research, we wrote them a a teacher support program, which is about 90 minutes. Ambitious about autism have campaigning and resources around exclusion. And you can go to the uh, university website as well, the Birmingham University website. Un šeit ir dažas saites, kur arī meklēt dažādas materiāls, dažādu informāciju. Pirmajā par izslēgšanu šeit ir dati un šeit ir arī apmācības, apmācību pro īsais apmācību kurs skolotājiem un arī otru tātad organizācijas mājas lapu un Birm- Birmingemas uh, universitātes okay. centra lapa. Thank you very much. You're probably all exhausted from listening to me for over an hour. But any questions? Iespējams, ka visi ir noguruši vairāk kā stundi, man klausoties, bet vai ir kādi jautājumi? Es aizvēršu mikrofonu. And if there are questions online as well, please feel... No, but if there are, if anyone online wants to ask a question, you can do, and we'll pick it up. Sorry? Okay. Um, I am doctor psychiatrist and yeah. also working in school and the question is um, and maybe with broad those doctors also will answer but um, the question is the difference uh, 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 in the attitude or uh, uh, communicating with a child with autism only and ADHD and autism thank you okay. 
Tātad jautājums par to, par atšķirību komunikācijā ar bērnu, kam ir tikai autismas vai bērnu, kam ir arī otra diagnoze uzmanības deficīta UDHS? I think uh, so the question is around do you have to adapt communication style if it's autism, autism and ADHD or ADHD. Um, I think the point that I would start with and I would always go to this is you need to understand the child and this comes down to pupil profile again. So by working with the child, doing observations, uh, speaking to the parent, you can then work out what the communication profile is of that individual and then you need to look at adapting your communication style based on that. So you, you have a, yeah, please carry on. Do you want to have another question? Yeah. Do you have any more more specific uh, like advice, or I will interpret what you just okay. said. Yeah. Uh, tā atbildes pirmā daļa bija, ka, protams, komunikācija vienmēr jāpielāgo bērnam, jāanalizē šīs bērns, un te ir uh, atgriežos atkal pieminējušos skolēna profila lapas, kas tiek aizpildīta saziņu ar vecākiem, un tad attiecīgi ņemot vērā visus bērna, visus bērna traucējumus, arī attiecīgi tik pielāgot komunikāciju. I think in terms of distress behavior, what you're looking to do is to really reduce your communication input for a child who's showing increased stress. So I think, and also obviously, even within your disor disorder, for want of a better word, but within the condition, you see differences in terms of communication style. And that does relate to distress behavior as well. So an autistic kid, their persistent disruptive behavior may be related to impulsivity. They can't stop themselves asking a question, okay? Whereas another autistic child may not communicate at all, may just sit at the back of the class very quietly getting on with their work. But some teachers interpret that as persistent dis disruptive behavior as well because they feel that the child is not engaging. So I think you do need to alter your communication style depending on what kinds of things that you're seeing that you kind of regard as disruptive behavior for want of a better word. I think with autistic kids and ADHD kids, they kind of vary. So you need to be varying your adaptations to whatever you're seeing in front of you. Nu jā, protams, ja ir attiecīgi jāpielāgo šis un uh, viena no lietām, ko pielāgot noteikti būtu uh, komunikācija, jo šie traucējumi bērniem var izpraukties dažādi. Vienam, piemēram, šī stresa uzvedība var būt impulsīva, ka viņš nespēja sev kontrolēt un nespēja apstāties, kā tas cits varbūt nekomunicēja vispār un uh, sēž klases aizmugurē un skolotājs to arī nepareizi interpretē kā pastāvīgi traucējošu uzvedību, kā uzvedības traucējums. Tātad so with an impulsive child, for example, you could use something that's on a visual cue on the table, on their desk, that kind of is a breakdown of when and how they should be asking questions. And maybe that will help in terms of their impulsivity. With a child who's very reserved and not communicating, what you may need to do is to kind of coach them a little bit and look at their social and kind of performance anxiety, which I think a lot of autistic kids have, and maybe do some work with them outside of the lesson to reduce that anxiety. Maybe, for example, a reasonable adjustment is when the child stands up, they're at the back of the class, and you say to the pupils, please don't turn around when Johnny stands up, that kind of thing. Nu jā, piemēram, lai impulsīvu uzvedību kontrolētu, tur varētu izmantot kaut kādus vizuāls līdzekļus, ka nu, tiek dotas signāls ar vizuālu līdzekli. Varbūt atkal bērnam, kas ir noslēgts un vispār nekomunicē, varbūt ar viņu ir nepieciešams pastrādāt ārpus stundas. Varbūt, piemēram, ja viņš sēž pēdējā solā un saņemas un pieceļas un kaut ko teiks, tad varbūt pārējiem ir jāpasaka, ka tajā brīdī negriezieties apkārt un neskatieties uz viņu. Jautājums no Facebook okay. uh, skatītājiem. Vai autisms var samazināties ar laiku un, protams, liels paldies par superīgo lekciju? So it's from it's from Facebook. Mm. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. And the question is, can autism like reduce over time? Can it get less? Yeah, I think the, the simple answer is. Do you know what I was... I was 
I was looking at a um, presentation yesterday and it reminded me of a piece of research. And I kind of think I'd forgotten about it until I saw this graph yesterday. What we don't have in autism research, which is a massive hole, is about trajectories. We don't know how kids appear over time. In research, it's called longitudinal research. So you see a kid at five and you track them over time. Īsā atbildi ir jā, var, un skatoties prezentāciju vakar, es sapratu, ka mums nav tādu pētījumu, kur mēs zīmētu šīs līknes zīmētu trajektorijas, kā tad tas notiek, un kāda šīs izmaiņas notiek. So, when you looked at the, the data that they collected, there were, I think there were four or five different groups. Some of them didn't change, so some of them kind of stayed pretty flat, and probably that may be related to an underlying intellectual disability, but it wasn't clear from the data. But I think one of the most interesting things was some of them, it was about 15% take off, and it wasn't in any way related to early intervention. So around the age, just before 10 years of age, about 15% of kids go from let's say a scale is 1 to 10, they go from a 4 to a 9, OK? Un uh, tas pētījums, ko es uh, skatījos, tur bija četras grupas, uh, bija grupas, kurās nekas nemainījās, uh, bet tur nebija tāda īsta pamatojuma kāpēc, bet bija arī grupas, kur līkne bija ļoti strauja un ļoti strauja mainīga un piemēram no skalā 10 punktu skalā no 4 pēkšņi ap noteiktā vecumā ap pēc 10 gadiem ap pacientiek vecumu šis rādītājs palielinājās līdz 9, bet tur nebī īsti skaidrs, vai tur ir jāsaugās uz kaut kādām intelektuālo attīstību vai vai citiem. Uh, and, and some kids have amazing outcomes. And it's all to do with the sorts of things that I talked about today. It, in most of it is not to do with the child, it's about what we do with the child. And so what we need to strive for as a community is to know more about good outcomes as well as bad outcomes. We often focus too much on bad outcomes, good outcomes and what makes good outcomes. Un ir arī tādi bērni, kas sasniedz ļoti labu sniegumu, ļoti labu rezultātu, un visbiežāk tas ir tā, nav saistīts ar pašu bērnu, bet to, kā ar šo bērnu tiek strādāts. Un mēs kaut kā, mums ir tendence fokusēties uz sliktajiem iznākumiem, sliktajiem rezultātiem, bet būtu vairāk jāpievērš uzmanība labajiem gadījumiem ar labiem iznākumiem, lai redzētu, kas ir palīdzējis tos labos iznākumus sasniegt. So, um... I'm not saying this is true for everyone, but what we don't do as a community is really focus in on that. And I'll give you a, a, an example. This was a young person who I met when he was 18. Uh, he had uh, a very clear history of autism. And he came to work with us when I was at the University of Oxford. He came to work with us in our department for work experience. Un, kā jau teicu, un tā mums tāda sabiedrības tendence, bet es gribētu pastāstīt piemēru par 18-gadīgu cilvēku, kam bija skaidri jau sen atpakaļ diagnostisēts autismus, un 18 gados viņš atnāca pie mums uz universitāti darbu praksē strādāt. So, when he was about 12, so he was in one of these units attached to a mainstream school, and when he was about 12 years of age, he looked at the other boys and realised that they were all playing and talking about football. Un uh, kad viņam bija aptuveni 12 gadi, viņš bija vispārējās, vispār izglītojošajā skolā, tad uh, viņš uh, ievēroja, ka citi zēni sarunājas par futbolu. And a teacher spent a little bit of time working with him about learning the rules, what you do, what you don't do. So she broke it down in a structured way and he was quite interested in who the teams are, what the scores were, so he was interested in the numbers, but combining together it gave him the confidence then to approach or mix in with some of the other boys and talk about football and then they invited him to join the school team, he became the school captain. When he came to work with us in Oxford, he, in, I'm surprised we have this, he was prom king, okay, he's gone on to be married, have kids, and he's now the chief executive of a big autism charity in the UK. Un šajā vecumā skolotāji bija pamanījusi, ka viņam ir tāda interese, un mazliet vairāk pastrādājusi ar viņu struktūrētu pastāstījusi par futbolu, par noteikumiem, par komandām. Pēc tam viņš tā kā tika piesaistīts komandai, 
kur viņš kļuva par kapteini, tad jau viņš bija kļuva jau par skolā populārāko puisi, un viņam dzīvē visi kārtībā, viņš ir precējies, un tagad viņš vāda lielu autismu labdarības organizāciju. So his key to open, to open things up was, was knowing, learning about football, and it's the simplest thing, and it was the simplest thing that the teacher did. It wasn't the only thing, but we need to identify those keys that kind of unlock potential and lead to better outcomes. Nu, tātad viņa gadījumā tā atslēga uz uh, potenciālu atsliekšanu bija futbols, protams, tā nebija vienīgā lieta, kas tika darīta, bet tas vienkārši parāda, ka ir jāmeklē šīs atslēdziņas, kas kuram nostrādās. Yeah. One more question, yeah. Um, vai var iepazīties ap pērtniecisko darbu par sejas izteiksmi uztveršanu? Šī tēma ļoti uzrunāja, jo bērns bieži sabīstās no skolotājiem, lai gan viņi saka, ka nav bijuši dusmīgi. Uh, is it possible to learn somewhere to, uh, about this uh, research about facial expressions? Oh, okay. Because that's a mom, mom probably asking and she says that her child often says uh, he gets frightened by teachers, although teachers okay. say that they are not showing yeah. any angry faces at him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what... Uh, uh, oh, no, I've not put it up. Have I? No, I've not put it up. Sorry. I thought I'd done this, because I'm using two computers. So, if hopefully she can see. Those are my... That's my personal email address and my Birmingham email address. She can email... Actually, do my personal one, and I'll send her the papers. And I'll also, just, if she has some questions, I'll answer the questions she's got, because it's a great, great one. Jā, paldies par jautājumu, un cerams, ka redzat uz ekrāna manu arī privāto e-pastu adresi, kas ir pirmā Gmail, tā tad rakstiet uz šo, es, es atsūtīšu materiāls, un tāpat arī citiem, un ja ir citi jautājumi, tad lūdzu rakstiet un jautājiet. Any other questions? You're more than welcome to come and ask me directly if you prefer to get off and have a coffee. Like Only big thanks from the audience. For okay. Some, thanks for listening. All right. Yeah. yeah, I'll be around. So feel free to come and say hello and email me if you have any questions or you want any resort. <laughs> I was saying to, to a group earlier, the UK is full of resources. We have so many documents, so many tools and things like that. So just feel free. Most of them are free to use, you just need to translate them into to Latvian. Jā, un lektors arī tagad nebēgs projām un varat pieiet un aprunāties un tiešām esat laipni. Laipni lūgt uzdot jautājumus, rakstīt jautājumu, jo apvienotajā karalistē ir ļoti daudz materiālu lielākā daļa no tiem ir pieejami bez maksas lietošanai, tie vienkārši jāiztulko latviešu valodā. Paldies!